Finance. And I call Justin McNulty to ask the first question. Mr McNulty. question number one. Minister. Regulation of the financial services is a reserve matter for the British Government and there is a limited role my department can play. But I do engage regularly with local banks and with trade union representatives on local services and jobs matters. I last called senior representatives from the local banks to a roundtable meeting on the 24th of March, where I pressed them on the need to protect the services they provide to citizens and businesses in the North and the jobs that go with these. Separately, I met with the Bank of Ireland in February to discuss their planned branch closures, and earlier that month I wrote to the NatWest CEO to raise my concerns about the closure of the Ulster Bank in the South and the impact of this on the staff in the North who service those operations. Supplementary, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Minister, for your answer thus far. Minister, our cross-border banks have long been a driver of our, of our all island economy, but some of these banks are divesting from both sides of the border. Ulster Bank, as you mentioned, closed its operations in the south, and Bank of Ireland closed branches in the north, including in Katy and in Cross in their own constituency. This divestment is made worse because financial services are, are not covered by the protocol. Minister, your budget document made clear that it is your department's responsibility to lead on financial services. What specifically are you doing to protect the all island economy against the damage done by banks scaling down their operations on either side of the border? Well, I think he's possibly mistook leading on financial services with leading on a matter which we don't regulate, and we don't regulate the banks. That, that power lies in Westminster. Uh, so I don't have that authority to actually uh, dictate or control in terms of, of what these uh, private corporations do. What I can do and what I have done is to raise with them uh, issues of concern. It's also uh, primarily an issue of concern for the Department of the Economy as well. Uh, but to raise that, I have, I have met with them. I have had a round table with them. I have pressed them in relation to uh, the need to continue services, particularly over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and, and then I have pressed uh, with them, indeed with Bank of Ireland, in, in relation to rural services uh, and the loss of services in rural areas and uh, some expectation that post offices or others can pick up these services when clearly uh, in, in relation to benefits that is not the case uh, with a large number of these. So there are very real challenges. Uh, they make commercial decisions in the interests of their own corporations, but I do think there is responsibility on them, in the, uh, particularly in the challenging economic times we face, given that when they were facing very challenging times it was the state. Uh, north and south uh, that bailed the banks out and, and kept them afloat. Uh, so I do think there is responsibility to the people uh, that we all represent to, and businesses and others to ensure that they continue to provide service. And I will continue to engage with them uh, in that regard in the time ahead. I call Steve Egan. Uh, thank you, I thank the Minister for his uh, answers so far. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, letting us know that you have already had discussions with the Chief Executive of NatWest. But obviously one of the major concerns we'll have was the desegregation process with the Ulster Bank and the fact that the Ulster Bank is heading towards greater merger with NatWest. Could the Minister say if he's had any discussions about the re retention of the vital uh, back office uh, functions and jobs here in Northern Ireland and what we can do to retain them here? Well, I, the, Alison Rose, as the CEO, assured me the bank's commitment to support their customers and colleagues and she advised that Ulster Bank business in the North is unaffected by the withdrawal of Ulster Bank from the South. Uh, an orderly phase withdrawal of Ulster Bank in the South will take place over a number of years, and there will be no new compulsory departures or branch closures from the businesses this year as a result of this announcement. And we will obviously closely monitor uh, that situation. As I say, the regulation and the authority over the financial services lies in London uh, and also lies in Dublin uh, for those that are south of the border. Uh, but we will continue to engage and we will continue to press and to remind these institutions that they have a responsibility to people, they have a responsibility to businesses, they have to recognise that the, uh, the globe is going through a very challenging economic time and that financial institutions have a part to play in that, as the citizens uh, had a part to play when the financial institutions were in trouble. Call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses thus far. Uh, as the Minister will be acutely aware, many businesses are coming out of these restrictions heavily indebted as a result of the downturn in trade over the last year. What engagement has the Minister had with the banks, and what message does he send to the banks about the need for them to show forbearance to enable these businesses to come back? Well, that's, that's the very discussion we had at the round table was about their, the need to continue to support the, the loan uh, scheme that came uh, from Treasury. Uh, and, and the, uh, I, I know that the uh, Treasury had been considering for the flexibilities in terms of paying that back as people began to earn rather than uh, attached to a time frame. Uh, and we, of course, we continue to talk to Treasury about that. But I do think 
There is, needs to be that recognition, as I have said, uh, that these are very challenging times, uh, that businesses will need support to get back to full trading again, that it will be some time before that is achievable, uh, and that the banks and other financial institutions have a role in relation to that, just as we had a role in relation to their difficulties. I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, Ken Collier, uh, and I thank the Minister for his responses to this point. And, and just further to the, the previous questions, can I ask uh, the Minister if he has had any engagement with the Financial Services Union, uh, which represents bank workers throughout Ireland, on the idea of a forum which will bring together key stakeholders, including executive banks and workers? Yes, I, I did, as well as meet the banks themselves. I did meet the Financial Services Union uh, on a range of issues, and it did include their call for establishment of a banking forum to discuss the future of banking in the South and here in the North, and I indicated that I was supportive of that in principle. And my officials are currently considering their proposals for forum and are given further consideration to understand the particular practicalities of how it might work here. In addition, my officials are engaging with the Financial Services Union to further understand the position of the Irish Government. Uh, this is an opportunity for all stakeholders to get involved in the discussion to consider the key issues facing the local banking sector. Uh, and therefore, I raised that concept at the recent roundtable with the banks uh, and asked for their views on whether they would sit in the forum. Although they did not provide a clear position and membership, of course, would be voluntary, I continue to press the local banks on the merits of such a forum. I call Melissa McHugh. The COVID funded support to business administered by my department since the start of the pandemic included the rates holiday the £10,000 grants to small businesses, LRSS, and the three schemes I recently announced to use up unspent funding. In total, my department is anticipated to spend just over a £1 billion in business support. For a department that does not usually administer grant support to businesses, that is a tremendous achievement, and I would like to thank LPS for stepping up during the pandemic. The Department for the Economy has spent £494.9 million in business support. Of this, some £200 million has been administered by the Department of Finance, bringing the total administered to my department to over £1.2 billion. I know from talking to businesses how important all of this support has been in sustaining jobs during the COVID crisis. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for your answer. Um, there is no doubt about it there has been a, source of, a, a, a huge scale of financial assistance to the business community. Uh, can you actually tell us, Minister, now when we would expect the 5,000 and the 10,000 uh, K grants to be paid out? Yeah, well, as I said, the, the Department is currently working through three schemes of business support, and that one particular scheme we expect that payments uh, should begin by the end of the month and, and flow through from there on after. Call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question three. Uh, could I congratulate the member on her elevation in recent days? Uh, the launch date for the fund, the Shared Property Fund, has been continuously pushed back. And while a prospectus has been promised by the summer, I am not expecting to have any detail on quantum until the next Westminster spending review. We have been promised a governance role for this fund, but we have no detail of that role. My officials continue to push for involvement in the development and delivery of this fund and a respect for our devolved competence. A pilot scheme for the Shared Prosperity Fund has been launched under the name Community Renewal Fund, and the £11 million set aside for project here under this fund is considerably less than the approximately £70 million per annum we would have previously received from comparable EU structural funds. The Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government plans to deliver the funding here directly, with little or no role for the executive in delivering the funding. It is also been indicated that the Shared Prosperity Fund may operate in this way. This would mean our EU funding will not be replaced, leaving a significant hole in our budget, and put MHCLG in competition with the executive departments and local government for projects here. This cuts across our devolved responsibilities. I call Paula Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister um, for his answer. And I know the Minister has been working hard on this, and I know he has been um, lobbying on behalf of, of our executive to get this money through. Um, are, are, are there any early indicators um, of, of any of those groups and, and the wonderful work that is being done out there, and how that might suffer because of, of the lack of continuity in the funding? Well, th th there is, I suppose, such a, a, a dearth of information in relation to that, uh, that, that groups that previously would have uh, relied on that support uh, have, have not necessarily got it. Now, we did fund 
at the end of the last financial year some additional money to the Department of the Economy uh, to continue schemes that they would have got under European funding uh, because there was, there was nothing coming through at that point. Uh, we have this indication uh, that 11 million is earmarked for here. That doesn't mean we're getting 11 million on comparable schemes last uh, over previous years. We got, I think, it was 70 million euros. So, uh, uh, whatever the comparable uh, sterling figure with that, with, for that uh, was, but it is a real uh, area of uncertainty because, as you know, quite a lot of community groups, quite a lot of people who are working out in that voluntary community sector and providing vital services in, in, in communities that, that rely very heavily on those, have relied on EU funding. And so our uh, uh, inability to give them certainty in terms of funding going forward is a real challenge. And the loss of that level of funding and the inability of the executive to allocate, as we previously did, EU funding against our priorities and to make sure it's got onto the ground where it's needed most uh, is now removed. And that means that Groups like that will be competing with groups right across Britain uh, for a much lower level of funding. So it is a very uncertain and unacceptable uh, place to be, and we will continue, as I do with my Welsh and Scottish counterparts, to raise this with Treasury at every opportunity. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. The uh, governance and la lack of information on the, on the shared prosperity fund is totally unacceptable. Uh, can I ask the Minister what? the latest update is he has had from the Economy Department on the shortfall of funding uh, in relation to InvestNI. InvestNI was in significant receipt of European money, and uh, towards the end of last year it was reported that they were around £60 million uh, in deficit as a result. What is the latest update on that? Well, if we did uh, allocate some funding to the Department for the Economy before the end of the last financial year uh, to cover some of the gaps they had in relation to some uh, jobs intervention schemes. I, I'm not certain whether they were uh, uh, directed through Invest in I or not, but we, I, I, I think the, the figure was in the region of £40 million. Uh, I can uh, double check that and, and, and uh, communicate that out to the member. Uh, and as he knows, the Department of the Economy now has a standstill budget uh, for this year. Uh, and that presents significant challenges. And while we are, have been able uh, to fully allocate the money for the economic recovery programme that they have developed, which will involve uh, undoubtedly job promotion and apprenticeships, and I'm sure will involve Invest in I, uh, there is no guarantee that we can replace any of that other funding uh, that Invest in I would have relied on in, in previous years. So it is, uh, as he says, unacceptable. It is very challenging. Uh, we haven't got certainty in relation to that the position. Uh, and certainly, what has been indicated so far. Uh, does, falls way short of what we previously would have been receipt of, and that also applies to agriculture. I think we've identified a shortfall of some £14 million pounds in relation to what they would have previously received under EU funding. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I ask, maybe you permit me a moment or two to wish Paula Bradley um, all the very best on her elevation. Paula and I, of course, are former council colleagues or adversaries, whichever way you look at it. We, we wouldn't say that, but I uh, genuinely wish her well. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, can I ask a question if the Minister can confirm whether his department, either solely or with the Department for Communities, is working with local councils to organise the bids for the uh, Community Renewal Fund? Uh, no, uh, we aren't. The, the, the way the, the the Community Renewal Fund has been set up. We have been told that the only, the only area that the Executive can have an interest in is the transport area, because it is the sole authority responsible uh, for public transport here. Uh, the other two uh, themes, if you like, of this uh, Community Renewal Fund are around uh, town centre renewal, and even though communities would have uh, a very natural interest in that, we are told that that is not an area where executive bidding can be allowed. And uh, culture and arts is the third theme, and again, we have been told that that is not the function of the executive. So uh, I am sure if the councils or anyone else come to us, we will provide whatever information and assistance we can. Uh, but it, it, it is very unclear as to how this is functioning, and the executive has been restricted to one particular aspect of it. Nicole Nicola Brogan. The Department of Finance Innovation Lab delivered a one-day insight lab on Wednesday, the 5th of May 2021, which was designed to encourage consensus on a roadmap that would deliver the Department's aims of increasing social value in public procurement. The event engaged with participants sought thoughts on timeframes, targets and scoring with a view to inform a roadmap to an effective and workable policy that can be implemented quickly. Participants also considered case study contributions provided by a number of invited keynote speakers from across these islands. The ILAB report will inform a paper that will be presented at the next procurement board meeting on the 9th of June. 
I thank the Minister for his answer and I'd like to commend him for his ability to find new and innovative ways of working, in this case to generate um, employment and opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have been there. Um, can the Minister outline when he expects the new social um, value policy to come into force? Well, the, the intention, as I said at the end of the Innovation Lab, is to uh, collate that. I've already uh, spoken and had a, a discussion with officials. Who, who were involved and managed that from the procurement side, <clears throat> and it's to uh, compile the outcome of that into a paper which we are already developing to bring to the procurement board on the 9th of June. And in anticipation that that uh, gets through the procurement board, uh, my intention then would be to bring that to the executive at, a, at the earliest possible uh, opportunity. We have changed the way we've done uh, procurement policy to bring matters like this to the executive for the executive's endorsement. That gives it a much stronger place in each department then, rather than just simply a policy issue for the Department of Finance. Uh, so I look forward to uh, that meeting with the Procurement Board to get in this very important area of work advance and then get an executive endorsement to make sure that there's a consistent approach across all government departments and all arms length bodies. I call Doug Beatty. Question number five, please. Again, can I congratulate. I believe congratulations are due to the member also. There has been a lot of elevating going on in recent days, uh, but uh, I wish him well in his new role. Uh, can I say, in relation to the question he's asked, that he's referring to reports commissioned by the Minister for Justice. And officials from the Department of Justice are engaging with officials in uh, NICS HR, as it's known as the Human Rights uh, or the, sorry, the HR, the Human Resources uh, uh, capacity within the Department of Finance, and they're engaging with them on the implementation of the relevant recommendations contained within those reports. Implementation falls to the Department of Justice and that department's best place to report on progress. However, I understand that Department of Justice officials have been engaging with Nick's HR and have identified as a priority a recommendation to embed a HR team within the prison service. Nick's HR already has some staff embedded within the prison service and work on developing this is further progressing well. It is envisaged that the embedded team will be in place by the summer of this year. I'll do Bailey supplementary. Uh, Thank you, Minister. And, and, and you nearly looked at, at my, my supplementary and gave me the answer straight away, uh, because it was about that embedding of staff uh, within the headquarters of the Northern Ireland Prison Service, because it is so uh, unique in the, in the way it delivers its, its service compared to other civil, civil services. C could you give us an, a, an outline and not just want to just maybe extrapolate a little bit on what you just said? Do, do we know how many people we are likely to put in as part of that team in, in that particular grade that's been recommended? Well, as I said, there already are a number of people allocated to HR within the prison service, but I think the report's recommendation was for a, a bespoke service. As he said, there are unique features there uh, which do require uh, its own particular service. Uh, so I, I don't have the detail. The Department uh, between Justice and, and Finance will have that, but I do know that when the team is in place, they are going to look at that HR function and other prison uh, service operations to make sure that they have a comparable uh, approach there, and one which obviously builds on best practice elsewhere. I call Chris Little, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update with regards to the removal of the NICS HR use of the term inefficient when referring to prison officers absent from work due to mental ill health, and ask if the Department of Finance has scoped costs for the recommended extension of eligibility for the Police Rehabilitation and Retraining Trust support to former prison officers? Well, uh, can I say in relation to the first issue that he's raised, the absent management policies have merged to create one new sickness absence management policy in which the word inefficiency is not included in its title. Uh, it is only referred to at the dismissal stage. And the reason for this is the grounds for dismissal are linked to rules set out in the NICS compensation scheme, which uses the term inefficiency. As soon as trade union consultation is complete and DSO has completed a final review of the revised policy, revised letter suites and guidance will publish, and that is expected to be no later than the end of June this year. Uh, in relation to the second matter, I will have to go and, and make some inquiries, and I will come back to the member in writing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. On the broader point, Minister of Civil Service Reform, we know there are profound issues. Reports keep telling us that, including from the National or the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Um, last year, we are expecting a full package of civil service uh, reform. When, when, when can we expect to see that? Well, we are progressing at, uh, as, as you speak, and uh, of course, that is a matter that we will take the lead on in the Department of Finance. But it does apply to all departments, and I expect the. Uh, 
the Public Accounts Committee, I think, to follow up on that uh, audit office report with a report of its own. I know officials have been in front of the Public Accounts Committee, uh, given uh, the, uh, some uh, information and, and evidence in terms of progress on these matters. He will know that we are out for a very substantial recruitment programme at the moment. We want to push forward a very substantial apprenticeship scheme across the civil service, and all of these will contribute to an influx of new members and, and hopefully a much more diverse uh, uh, input into the civil service reflecting society as a whole. And we will continue to progress that, and I will keep the member and keep the committee that he's on updated as we do that. Daniel uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I also congratulate Paula Bradley and also uh, Doug Beatty uh, on their recent elevations and wish them well for the challenges ahead? Uh, question six, Minister. Due to the nature of the EU funds, the financial framework in which they operate, and the uncertainty around replacing funding, it is difficult to quantify loss of EU funding for 2021-22. Despite the British Government's assurance that farm payments would be funded in full due to the approach they have taken, DERA are projecting a 14.4 million loss in farm payments for 2021-22. The continued lack of information in the Community Renewal Fund and the Shared Prosperity Fund means that we are unable to make a complete assessment of the reduction in spending power in relation to the other funds. However, with the limited information we have, coupled with the delivery mechanism for these replacement funds, the result is likely to be detrimental to the Executive's budget, which, if the Shared Prosperity Fund is delivered in the same way, will be amplified in future years. The Department for the Economy was allocated £42.5 million by the Executive in the 2021 January monitoring round to help mitigate the impact of reduced EU structural funds income for the 2021 year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, uh, um, what are you doing to ensure the replacement of funding for cross-border projects uh, that is determined and, lo and allocated locally, rather than it being uh, distributed and decided directly from London? Well, it, it, it depends very much on what London intends to distribute the, that funding for. Of course, you will know that the peace. Uh, Funding will continue, and will be we're currently uh, out consult consulting in relation to Peace Plus, which, uh, pardon me, takes in the old Peace funding, which is now in the Peace Four stage, plus the Interreg funding, which was specifically in relation to cross-border uh, projects as well, uh, and they will be merged into one uh, fund, which will continue, which will start and continue on for five or six years. I think there's over up now potentially over a billion euros in that fund. Uh, of course, we will continue to engage with the Government in Dublin in relation to the Shared Island Fund, which I think which also will be beneficial in cross-border terms. Uh, but where some of the projects that currently exist and were funded under the EU uh, funding schemes uh, they, that, that do not fall within Peace Plus or indeed the, the Shared Island Fund, then we will continue to engage with Treasury, uh, as I have been doing with both my Scottish and Welsh counterparts, uh, to, to establish the, the, the fact that the Executive should have a role in relation to doing that, that the spending here should be against executive priorities, not levelling up priorities that are decided in Whitehall, uh, and that particularly in relation, uh, we have a unique set of circumstances here in, use, in relation to cross-border projects which are in two different jurisdictions, uh, and to respect that, and we continue to engage with Treasury on that basis. I can call you and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Um, clearly, our budgets are under ever increasing pressure as a result of cuts to the block grant and also, as described, the loss of European funding. Both of these, I might add, are as a result of decisions taken in Britain. Can I ask the Minister to also outline the medium to long term impact of the um, COVID pandemic on the budget? Well, we have received, uh, uh, as a member will know, last year we received a, a significant allocation. Oh, she's there. <laughs> I was looking in the wrong area. We, uh, she, we received a significant additional allegation of COVID funding, 3.3 billion, uh, some of which we've been able to carry over. Uh, but we are struggling this year with a, a flat cash uh, rollover budget, uh, and we have so far, I think, received somewhere in the region of 900 million uh, of additional COVID funding, uh, which we, we allocated largely. Uh, with the uh, budget that was announced in, in the last number of weeks. Uh, we are currently engaged in an exercise looking at, at about £300 million of that to try and get it allocated, so departments have a sense uh, uh, early in the year of what they may have to spend. That is as much as we have indicated we are going to get, uh, and that is going to be very, very challenging. Uh, and that is against the backdrop, I think, of a general economic downturn, which is expected, although I think in the early stages of reopening, people will expect some increase in economic activity, but over the longer period there is expected to be a downturn, and that will mean less revenue for a lot of government departments as well. Uh, 
So uh, it is going to be a very challenging time. Uh, we are glad of the additional money we have received, but uh, I have no doubt that the, the approach of a one-year budget, which does not give us any additional cash, uh, is going to be very challenging for the executive. We call Roy Beggs. Question number seven. The Community Renewal Fund is the pilot for the Shared Prosperity Fund, which is intended to replace EU structural funds. I have discussed both funds extensively with ministers from Cabinet Office, Treasury, MHCLG, NIO, and from other devolved areas. I have also had frequent engagement with local government and third sector organisations. My most recent, meet, most recent meeting was with Michael Gove at the Cabinet Office on the 12th of May. Prior to that, together with the Economy and Infrastructure Ministers, met with MHCLG and NIO Secretaries of State on the 10th of March. The £11 million has not been allocated to us, as the question suggests. The MHCLG plan to deliver directly using the Internal Market Act. It is also not new money. It is spending power that should have been given to the Executive to deliver. This approach cuts across the responsibilities of the Executive. And the role envisaged for the executive is to apply for a limited range of the funding and to comment on applications. The £11 million also falls far short of the amount we would need to replace EU structural funding, where in the past years the executive has benefited from some £70 million per annum. On what we know so far about these funds, Brexit will have cost the executive a significant sum. Supplementary, Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Earlier, the minister seemed to be indicating that his department has not been the consultant over this fund, and yet I have local government uh, seeking to be consulted. But in the rest of the United Kingdom, local government are mentioned as a strategic partner in terms of coordinating and ensuring that there are uh, collaborative bids and maximising the opportunity. So, will the minister go back to the uh, Department of Housing, Communities and Local Government, seeking to ensure that there will be collaboration in Northern Ireland with local partners to maximise the opportunity that has been availed us? Well, that is what I would expect uh, that uh, Department to do. Uh, I have to say that we have not received that type of information. Local Government in Britain has a different function from Local Government here. It is much more limited. We have been told that there are three, as I say, themes to this. The Executive is only uh, uh, able to express an interest in one in relation to transport and the other areas of town centre renewal and arts and culture. Uh, those are outside of the executive. Uh, so we are happy to work with local government. We are happy to make sure that in the limited funding available and our limited input into it, uh, that we can maximise whatever we can from that. And we are happy to continue to engage with the departments in Britain because we have been trying to get as much information on these issues as we can uh, for some time now. Uh, and we continue to press for that information. And we will also continue to press for a different approach to doing this because the approach ultimately, even if we maximise what is possible under the current arrangements, is still way short of what the executive would have under EU funding. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, does the Minister share with me a, a, an amusement at the irony of uh, members of parties who uh, backed Brexit standing up and decrying the loss of EU funding that communities and local government in this place are facing as a result of Brexit? But can I ask the Minister, does he agree with me that one of the few opportunities there are is the Northern Ireland Protocol, which gives us access to two markets, including the European single market of half a billion people? Well, I don't recall that this has been written on the side of the bus when it was starting on the Brexit tour, that we were going to end up as net losers as a consequence uh, of this exercise, even though uh, I'm sure he will recall that many of us warned uh, of a detrimental outcome in relation to that. I, I do think that uh, there, there are significant opportunities. There are expressions of interest from different parts of the world as to our unique position in relation to both the British markets and the European markets. Uh, and I think it is time to get beyond the noise in relation to Bre Brexit and the protocol and actually uh, resolve any issues that arise from it. And, and there are supply chain issues across the world that are nothing to do with Brexit at all, which are impacting here as well. Uh, but to resolve those issues in the best interests of our businesses here and to get on with the opportunities that are presented by the, the situation in relation to the protocol and our unique position between both markets. And I call Paul Frew, and the member won't have time for supplementary. Question number eight. Thank you. The purpose of the Dormant Accounts Fund is to build capacity, resilience, and sustainability in the third sector. The purpose and criteria of the fund were informed by a significant consultation and engagement process with the sector, and has been co-designed to reflect this aspect of local needs. This includes supporting new and innovative ways of working, supporting cross-organisational work, and developing the skill sets in organisations to allow them to thrive into the future. 
There have been 211 applications to the fund between the 12th of January and the 30th of April. The fund does not have a closing date and remains open. To date, the success rate of applications has been relatively low, where many of the applications received have sought replacement programme funding and not met the capacity building requirements. My Department is working with the National Lottery Community Fund to promote the overall purpose and encourage new and resubmitted applications. The fund is not a programme replacement fund, rather it is designed to meet the gaps that traditional funding models cannot address. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Cherry Carroll. Mr. Speaker, Minister, in a previous answer to me about the pay offer to civil service workers uh, for this year and next year, quoted a higher figure than the 1 per cent. Can the Minister confirm that that figure was including progression around pay, which was due and is due to happen regardless of the pay offer? And can he confirm that the, the offer is 1 per cent for these workers? Well, what I can confirm is that the pay offer has been made to the recognised trade unions and a pay bulletin was issued to all civil service last month. It is a two year pay offer. It represents a 4.8% increase, increase on civil service pay bill over two years at a cost of $44 million. It would make the civil service a living wage employer, fulfilling the new decade, new approach commitment. It focuses on the lowest paid, fulfils the commitment to multi year pay offers where this is possible, and improves terms and conditions for staff. It is the best that can be offered in very difficult circumstances against a flat budget from Westminster. And importantly, the Executive agreed not to follow the pay freeze imposed by Westminster Government on, the most civil, on most civil servants in England for 2021. The pay offers a difficult balance between recognising civil servants for their work and managing public money carefully in the face of the most challenging economic position for many years. Supplementary, Jerry Carroll. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Minister, for his answer. Minister, my understanding is that 4.8% includes progression, and 60% of workers will not be seeing any real term increase in their pay. And I also understand that the Tories include progression as part of pay offers as well, as a way to disguise meagre, or, uh, meagre pay offers or pay cuts. And I expect workers to reject this uh, offer. And if they do, uh, they'll have my full support. If they do as well, what will the Minister's response be to those workers? Well, I will await the response. Uh, I have had uh, discussion and dialogue with a number of trade unions, uh, some who have been very receptive uh, to what has been an offer for them. Uh, others have taken issue with it, and that is their right. Uh, they all know uh, from my discussions with them uh, over the course of the year that I would like to be in a much better position to make a much better pay offer to them. Uh, but in terms of what has been available to us, uh, we have done our very best, and we have also got the executive to break with the policy that has been established in Westminster in terms of a pay freeze. Uh, and the last time a pay freeze was introduced in Westminster went on for a number of years, and it took, it took effect here as well. Uh, so we've broken with that tradition, and a number of them recognise and appreciate that. Uh, but I'll wait on the outcome of the consultation. It's up to the members to decide their approach, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll respond accordingly then. Carol Nicholson. Um, Minister, in relation to the, resp the response you give to Nicola Brogan uh, regarding the Social Value Act, could you even give us an indicative time when you anticipate the social value legislation being introduced to the Assembly, please? Well, uh, as the social value uh, measures that I, I was responding to uh, the member from West Tyrone in relation to were in relation to procurement policy matters. Uh, which we are currently progressing through the Procurement Board and then will take the Executive. I have uh, indicated uh, a long standing desire to do a social value legislation as well to complement uh, and reinforce that. Uh, obviously, with the pandemic and the uh, emergency approach to all of the other issues that all of the departments were facing, a, a lot of our planned uh, legislation has been kind of shunted sideways. We are trying to pick that up. I am hopeful that we will have time left in the mandate to get a social value uh, uh, legislation. Uh, devised and through uh, the, the Assembly. And I think what we are doing in terms of procurement will have a significant impact, but I would like to see that reinforced by legislation. So, um, if all being well, the Social Value Act does proceed through the Assembly, as, as we all hope, how will he ensure? That each department takes its responsibilities for procurement, commission, and tendering seriously. Well, I think part of the part of the reconstitution of the procurement board itself uh, was to do that, even even outside of legislation, was to recognise that. Uh, what we wanted to do was to, to bring on practitioners to get the best possible policies that were well tested and through dialogue on the board, but also then 
to make the approval of procurement policy an executive matter rather than just the Department of Finance. So in previous terms, the Department of Finance policy, uh, and we try to encourage other departments and, and down through to their arms length bodies and agencies uh, to respond accordingly. So I think, uh, and we agreed that with an executive endorsement of procurement policy, that then gives it a consistency through each department. So we will expect each minister and the executive to ensure that something they endorsed is followed through right down through the department. So uh, we, we would hope uh, that when we get this uh, policy agreed uh, within the next short while uh, and endorsed by the executive, then we will see some real change. And it is. Uh, it is a progressive policy. It's starting out where it needs to start to have impact, but its ambition is to go much further uh, over the time ahead. I call Karen Mullen. Ken Kohler. Uh, firstly, Minister, I would like to welcome your recent announcement on, of the opening of a recruitment process to appoint the 500 Grade 1 and Grade 2 Executive Officer positions within the Civil Service. Can the Minister confirm if any of these posts will be created in Derry? Well, as I say, the recruitment process has just started, uh, and it's part of a, a much wider uh, programme of reform within the civil service. The, uh, the, uh, we also want to push forward with an apprenticeship scheme, uh, which, which I, I think will also be beneficial. I'm told, I don't have the precise figures, I'm told that most of the jobs will be located between Belfast and the North West. Uh, and I think uh, that then will be complemented by the, the regional hubs that we are promoting, which mean that people who will be considering jobs in the civil service, particularly those who are head headquartered in Belfast, do not have the same consideration where they have to travel five days a week from more peripheral areas around the border in and out of Belfast every day, that it makes those jobs more available to them. So I would hope uh, over the course of all of these matters coming together that we see a much greater transition in the, in the make-up of the civil service, both in gender, in disability, in sexual orientation, and, and a civil service which truly reflects the entire society that it serves. Carmel, Thank you, Minister, for his answer. And as someone who travels uh, from, from those parts, I know it would be very, very welcome for many. Uh, Minister, can I ask if you would consider putting in place measures to ensure that those from the most disadvantaged areas and background are given the best opportunity to avail of these new employment opportunities? Well, we have been doing a, a substantial push in relation to the, the recruitment exercise that is ongoing uh, to make sure there is a very widespread knowledge of that uh, and that people are encouraged to apply and that the civil service makes it very clear that it is an equal opportunities employer and, and that they welcome applications from right across society. I think also the apprenticeship scheme will be important in actually looking to people who traditionally come from areas or sectors or geographical areas that would not have considered applying uh, to civil service, that people realise that there are opportunities for them there, uh, and that uh, through doing that and through, uh, as I say, changing the work practices as well in terms of the civil service state, we get a much more diverse uh, civil service which reflects society. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, my question relates to um, rates and rate support schemes. Obviously, if you're under the, the 15,000 uh, net annual value, or over the, the 51, if you were in the childcare sector, you would have received either the 10 or 25,000. But the, 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 the pot of money between the two, so between the 15 and the 51,000, though that sector wasn't fit to get the 25,000. Are you looking at adding that sector in, the childcare sector, to get that support? It, 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 no matter when we devise one of these schemes, you will always find the people in. The first people you hear are the people who have fallen outside for some reasons. And I actually had a discussion with uh, LPS this morning, uh, and that very issue was raised in relation to that specific part of the childcare sector. So it is very difficult to devise schemes to include everybody. We are operating on a very limited now left, amount left of COVID money. We have other areas, including multiples, that we have not been able to address to date, and we are trying to get support to them. And We recognise that other supports have been available for some sectors as well, so we are trying to take all of that into account. Uh, but I will continue to look at where we find gaps uh, and see what we can do in the time ahead. Uh, but we are coming to an end of that type of support scheme through the rates. Uh, body, uh, but uh, as I said, we did have a discussion in relation to this morning. I can't promise anything, uh, but I can promise that we will continue to look to see where gaps are and if there is anything to be done for them. Keep you can supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Minister. That answer so far. Just, just supplementary on the LRSS scheme, Minister. Some businesses had received three, five, six, eight thousand in my constituency, and now have been asked to pay it back because of errors in your department. Those businesses needed that money to pay bills. They've paid the bills, and now they're asked to pay it back. What would you say to those businesses? Well, I could say that uh, out of the hundreds of millions of pounds allocated over the course of that scheme, I think it was something like 1.7% uh, paid out in error. So it's a very high success rate. 
uh, for a scheme which was done quickly for an agency which was not a grant given agency which is actually a, a, a revenue uh, intake uh, agency that repurposed themselves to do that. So, uh, and uh, I accept that in doing that at, at the pace that that scheme was done, it was inevitable that there were going to be some mistakes. LPS will work with people. Firstly, if they feel that they are wrongly being asked to return money, they can appeal. And I know some of those have been revisited and, and the payments upheld then for them. Uh, so, the, I, I would advise them to, in the first instance, engage with the LPS, appeal if they feel uh, that they are being wrongly charged. Some of them may have wrongly received. Uh, LRSS, but they are actually entitled to some top-up, so you may find that one uh, payment will cancel out the other. So they should engage with LPS to find out if, if it is the case that LRSS was wrongly applied to them, they might be able to avail of an additional scheme then, which would actually uh, would, would, uh, compensate for that. Uh, but I would advise them in the first instance to engage, but it has been a very, very small uh, error in terms of a scheme which, which was huge and which was done at a very significant pace. Call Christopher Salford. Oh, sorry, sir. No, I'm fine. I wasn't aware I was on the list. Okay, I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I continue, like, like many other members, I'm sure, to receive a significant amount of casework in relation to the localised restrictions support scheme. Can the minister give us um, an update on the status of this scheme, particularly in relation to the backlog of payments? Well, I, I, I believe that they are working through, uh, through those as, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, the, uh, they were obliged, I think, in, in discussion with, uh, and good practice anyway, but in discussion with the audit office to, to reassess as they went along to make sure that where there were errors made, that they would, at a very early fashion, go in and try and recoup. Uh, the money lost, and so they have written to a number of, of uh, businesses in relation to that. Uh, they, uh, as I say, I am not certain that there is that much of a backlog at this stage, but I can find that out for the member uh, in terms of payments that are, are due uh, and valid for people. The, the main question in recent times has been the attempt to recoup uh, some of the money. As I say, it represents about 1.7 per cent, which is, is a significantly high level of success in terms of the, the scheme and, as I said in response to the previous question, or the pace at which the scheme was developed and the support got out on the ground. And I know people have uh, been very grateful for that. But where there are errors made, it is a difficult situation for businesses. The LPS will work with them uh, to make sure that, that, that the error is not in fact correct. They will then uh, make an arrangement with them if the money has to be recouped. But they can also offset that. So if the person is due another payment, perhaps on the top-up scheme for those who weren't getting LRSS, they, they, they should have fitted in there instead. Then they will ensure that that is taken from that, uh, rather than, than have to uh, them have to find the money to repay it themselves. So there are arrangements that can be worked through with them. Uh, but in relation to backlog, as I say, uh, I'm not aware that that's a significant issue now. But I, I will I will check with the department if there's anything in relation to that. I'll get back to the member. Supplementary, John Blair. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, when the LRSS scheme uh, ceases, businesses will continue to operate in a situation restricted in terms of profitability and overall operation because of continued COVID regulation restrictions. Can the Minister reassure us that that situation has been looked at on, in, in terms of solutions that need to be found? Well, the LRSS scheme is, is defined by regulation, and the regulation only allows them to pay out where a business has been advised and, and instructed to close or is very severely uh, impacted and restricted. And I think everyone recognises that businesses will struggle to get back to full trading because they, they, undoubtedly the uh, restrictions or the guidance in relation to social distancing and all that will be in place for some time, uh, and, and that will have an impact uh, on businesses. But, LRSS is only able to pay if, as I say, they are forced to close or very severely restricted. Uh, and so we have fully funded the economic support recovery package for the Department for the Economy uh, to try and assist businesses in other ways. And of course, there are measures coming through, like the voucher scheme, uh, the ongoing rates holiday for quite a lot of businesses for next year. So that will be two full, two full years for a lot of people in retail and hospitality who haven't paid rates. So there is continued support for businesses, but it will not be through LRSS because that is obliged to stop once the business can reopen. A number of members aren't in their places and move forward to Dagda Magalier. You may have only time for one question. Um, I'll get to ask her again, Colia. Could the Minister, uh, minister ma 
in reference earlier to, to, to question earlier, and he mentioned the levelling up fund. Is any update on that there? Because I note from previous previous answers that it uh, sites set the exact different relation to some of the other the, the UK the, the UK community fund. Is there what's the, the levelling up fund? Well, it's it's not so much a levelling up fund. It's, it's the ex expectation is that the, uh, the the shared prosperity fund will be kind of set against a levelling up agenda. Now, for most people who understand British politics, they will understand the levelling up agenda to be largely focused on the north of England, uh, where undoubtedly there is uh, economic deprivation. Uh, but there are significant areas of deprivation here, and I'm sure in Scotland and Wales as well. And in any dialogue I've had with the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers, we, we all feel that the levelling up agenda is very unique to England. Uh, and the, if that's the criteria against which uh, projects here will have to bid for support, and in competition with projects in England, then it would put us at an unfair disadvantage. So these are uh, these are issues. But the, the shared prosperity fund prospectus hasn't been released yet. It's expected to be released over the summer. The community renewal fund is, if you like, the pilot scheme for that. Uh, but if it continues in that vein, I, I think it will be detrimental uh, to projects here. I, I don't think that we will experience anywhere in the same. Uh, level of support that we would have had under EU arrangements. Thank you, members, and the time is up. Members, just please take your ease for a moment or two. Point of order, Mr. Allister.